Welcome to the Posture Strength and Mobility Podcast. I'm Isaac Osborne, and I'm here to share with you tips, tricks, hacks, interesting musings, and much more in short, digestible episodes. To learn more about how you can improve your posture, strength, and mobility, check out the show notes for links. On with the show. Episode 13, The Brain Science Around Change with Dr. Britt Andriata. Welcome to 2022. I hope your new year has started out with great success. And I'm wondering, have you set your goals yet? Even if you have, you will want to listen to this podcast. Goals are all about change and it matters how you approach that change or goal. So I have a special treat for you today. In this episode, I'm grateful to sit down and talk with Dr. Britt Andriata and discuss the brain science around change. Dr. Britt Andriata is an internationally recognized thought leader who creates brain science-based solutions for today's challenges. As CEO of Seventh Mind Incorporated, Britt Andriata draws on her unique background in leadership, neuroscience, psychology, and learning to unlock the best in people and organizations. Britt's industry accolades include being named one of the top 20 L&D influencers for 2021 and a top 100 HR influencers in 2021, top 20 for leadership development. Talent and Development Magazine featured her as an outstanding thought leader and pioneer in June 2017. Dr. Andriata has won several prestigious awards, such as the Global Training and Development Leadership Award from the World Training and Development Congress, the Gold Medal for Chief Learning Officer Magazine's Trailblazer Award. Britt has published several titles, including Wired to Connect, The Brain Science of Teams, and a new model for creating collaboration and inclusion. Wired to Grow, Harness the Power of Brain Science to Master Any Skill, and Wired to Resist the brain science of why change fails and a new model for driving success. She's a regular contributor to Entrepreneur Training Industry Magazine and Thrive Global. Formerly Chief Learning Officer for Lynda.com, now LinkedIn Learning. Britt is a seasoned professional with more than 25 years of experience. She regularly consults with businesses, universities, and nonprofit organizations on leadership development and learning strategy. Corporate clients include Fortune 100 companies like Comcast and Apple, and also Ernest & Young, Microsoft, Domino's, Franklin Covey, TransUnion, Splunk, DPR Construction, Rust Oleum, Zillow, SHI, Pacific Life, and Dell. Dr. Andriata has worked with major educational institutions like the University of California, Dartmouth University, sorry, Dartmouth University and the University of New Mexico and nonprofit organizations like the YMCA and Prison Fellowships Warden Exchange Program. She has served as professor and dean at the University of California, Antioch University and several graduate schools. Her courses on LinkedIn Learning, Skillsoft and Cornerstone On Demand have received over 10 million views worldwide. Titles include Leading with Emotional Intelligence, Advice for Leaders During a Crisis, 20 Questions to Improve Learning at Your Organization, Increasing Collaboration on Your Team, Organizational L&D, and Creating Winning Teams. A highly sought after and engaging speaker, Britt delivered a TEDx talk called How Your Past Hijacks Your Future. She regularly speaks at corporate events and international conferences, receiving rave reviews and awards for Best Session of Conference. Due to popular demand, Dr. Andriata now offers certifications in her brain-based training programs. These award-winning programs are driving sustained behavior change at organizations across a wide range of industries like technology, healthcare, financial, food, media, and manufacturing. Dr. Britt regularly consults with executives and organizations on how to maximize their full potential. To learn more, visit her website and social channels. All links are in the show notes. It was such a pleasure sitting down with Dr. Andriata and having this conversation with her. She is just a wonderful person. And we talked about why people resist change, what does it take to change, why repetition is so important for change, and much more. Before we get to the interview with Britt, a word from our sponsors. But please note, I will only endorse sponsors, products, or services that I personally use on this podcast. So here's a word from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Kajabi, the number one platform to grow your knowledge business. Kajabi makes it easy to turn the knowledge you already have into something you can sell. It's an all-in-one business platform with everything you need to create market, 
and sell digital projects from one dashboard. With Kajabi, you can create online courses, membership sites, podcasts. In fact, this podcast is through Kajabi. Coaching programs. You can send newsletters, mass emails, or campaigns. Build websites or specific landing pages and much more. They also have great analytics, mobile options for your content, and video hosting. With 24-7 support, virtual meetups, trainings, and a help center, there is always support for you to grow. I've used WordPress and other website builders, and I have yet to come across anything that is easier to run my business on than Kajabi. I've been using them for over a year now, and I'm super stoked. Check the show notes for a link to Kajabi and sign up for their free 14-day trial. Our other sponsor today is ButcherBox. I have been eating mostly a paleo diet for the last 20 plus years. Quality meat can be hard to find, especially grass-fed, grass-finished beef. I get mine from ButcherBox. What is ButcherBox? They send you high-quality, mainly raised meat and wild seafood every month. They source their meat and seafood from partners with the highest standards for quality. You can choose from four curated boxes or create your own custom box and a delivery frequency that meets your needs. Your order ships for free, frozen for freshness, and packed in an eco-friendly box. If you use the link in the show notes and sign up, you will get free bacon for life of your subscription and $30 off your first order. Check out the show notes for the link. Now, onward to the show. Like we talked about, like we mentioned before, our overall topic is change. <laughs> yes. And man, change is... Sucks. <laughs> it does. But it's also how you approach it, right? Right. How you approach change. Um, and in a lot of ways... And I don't, I don't fully, I don't fully buy into this. But Dr. Rolf, the founder of Rolfing, what she talked about with change is, pain is resistance to change. And I think there's definite truths to that. I don't think you can blanket statement, you know, across the board with everything on that. But I think a lot of change, or the pain, more painful the change. Typically, there's more resistance to it. And I equate that to uh, kind of like Buddhism talks about attachment is suffering, mm -hmm. you know. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today, Britt, is because not because just because you're a lovely human being, but <laughs> um, you are on the leading edge in bringing together brain science about change yeah. and and really really like highlighting all these wonderful concepts uh the latest of what's going on with change and so i know you come from more of a corporate background and helping large companies fortune 500 companies embrace certain things about change mm -hmm. and but us working together as um as professionals, working with you, training and body work and that stuff, I've just loved our conversations about change. And there's so many things that tie into my field yep. that I really want you to share and talk about because it, it all ties into it, right. regardless of how are you using it, right? right. Um, so what would you like to say about that before we get started into... Uh, all the questions that I have for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, you know, my own journey into to studying this came from being certified in all the pr prominent change models and then going through an acquisition where LinkedIn bought the company, lynda.com, mm -hmm. where I was working and realizing as I was going through it that none of the change models were helping mm -hmm. or explaining what I was experiencing on a daily basis. So my own... Mm -hmm exploration of it came, I had just written the book on the brain science of learning, Wired to Grow, and I was sitting in the middle of that going, wow, I wonder what brain science says about change. Mm. And my mind was blown. You know, some of the data points I found in some of the studies, uh, particularly out of neuroscience or biologically how we're wired around mm -hmm. change. So I would just say, um, 
Yeah, I love sharing this stuff. It definitely has applications when we think about putting large groups of people through change, like、mm. happens in organizations. But like the pandemic is a living example of all of us having to do it. And then certainly, you know, on a personal level, when we want to make about changes, changes that we even say we want, and then how we may or may not lean into that. So I'm、right. looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Britt. So back up a little bit on your history. That. At that time in your life at LinkedIn, how many years ago was that? The acquisition happened in 2015. So you've shot out on your own. Yep.、Uh, what are we the, <laughs> doing well, math here? Well, so <laughs> that year we、ago? went through the acquisition.、Yeah. I, I stayed at LinkedIn for a year, and、yeah. during that time, I wrote the book Wired to Resist,、okay. which was everything I found out about <laughs> what happens when we go through change,、right. and.、Um, And then I was like, "Oh, I guess I'm doing this." So then the third book was on the brain science of teams and what、mm-hmm. brings out the best of collaboration、mm-hmm. and inclusion and things. And then right now, in this moment in time, I've been doing a lot of research on burnout and where we are in in this pandemic and why it's why the great resignation is happening. Yes,、so. say a little bit about that. I would love to hear about that because、uh, let's tie into that the great resignation and the how people are. Why? Why is there a great res- resignation right now? What's what's going on? Like from your perspective, like you, you mentioned burnout. You、yeah. mentioned you know people are. What what did the pandemic provide that has catapulted people into this great resignation? Right. So burnout was an issue before the pandemic ever started. In、mm-hmm. fact, in May of 2019, the World Health, World Health Organization identified it as an occupational disease,、mm-hmm. and 53% of the workforce was already experiencing burnout. And in the U.S. alone, that was $200 billion in related healthcare costs. As you know, stress and burnout are really hard on the body,、mm-hmm. and it it takes a physical and emotional toll. What's interesting about burnout is it's not just being tired or feeling overwhelmed. It actually is a diagnosable state that has three components to it. The first is exhaustion, so it's、mm-hmm. just chronic fatigue, which leads to insomnia. You、mm-hmm. can have heart palpitations. You can、mm-hmm. have anxiety and depression. It's just literal chronic fatigue from being in an acutely stressful situation for too long.、Mm-hmm. The second part of burnout is a,、um, a depleted sense of accomplishment. So you feel like you're running on the gerbil wheel, and、mm-hmm. before when you got stuff done, you'd get that little dopamine rush from、mm-hmm. it. You'd feel、mm-hmm. good about your projects. You'd、mm-hmm. enjoy your teammates. And what happens is you start to feel like nothing you do is making a difference,、right. even if it is. You don't feel like it is,、right. so it puts people into kind of irritation, apathy, kind of checking out.、Mm-hmm. Pessimism, and then the third component is、um, we turn off or we use up our ability for empathy. So we no longer can feel empathy or compassion for others or ourselves.、Mm. So it's that quintessential: I have no more fucks to give. Right? <laughs>、um, I gave them all, and the pandemic. What's interesting about the pandemic is that we are wired to have these adaptive systems that help us move through a natural disaster,、mm-hmm. um, and even if we're exhausted, we can dig deep and kind of move through that.、Um, but it turns out this surge capacity that our body has has about a six-month limit to it.、Mm-hmm. And if you think about most natural disasters, like a tornado or a flood or something,、mm-hmm. by the time six months has rolled around, you've you've grieved the, your lost ones, you've started cleaning up, there's rebuilding.、Right. Well, the pandemic, we used up our surge capacity with it, you know, <laughs> by the holiday time of the right, first year. Right. So burnout was a problem before the pandemic. I think why it's been particularly challenging is that all the work from home, you know, p- burnout comes from overworking and under recharging.、Mm-hmm. So you're putting too many hours in, and you're not taking enough rest and recharging. And we lost access to all the things we do to rest and recharge.、Right. You know, going to dinner, having a vacation,、right. shopping, getting a pedicure, and then people were home and they were feeling all this stress of the pandemic, and so they just leaned into working harder.、Mm. We the workday extended from nine to twelve hours during the pandemic. Number one, or It, real big spike in logons and email services between midnight and three a.m. because we have insomnia, so people are working,、Crazy. and I think people just felt like, okay, well, if I can't feel safe and I can't ho- go have fun, at least I'll get shit done. 
Right. So some companies had their best years ever right. in the in the pandemic, but we're paying the price now. So the number one p- reason people are giving for quitting their job right now is burnout is number one. Mm-hmm. Number two is too much organizational change. Mm. And I think that's because change fatigue is a thing and change is happening all the time. And people were probably already overloaded with change. And then the pandemic just drove a bunch of changes from Mm -hmm. how to wash our hands and wear masks to working from home and using new tools and stuff. So um, people are pretty, pretty over it at this point. And And it's it's kind of like an insurmountable change too. Like like with COVID, there's like, you can't do anything about this. Right. Right. There's this, there's this helplessness. Yeah. You know, and that's infuriating when, when you can't really do anything about it. You have to sit back and kind of wait, see what's going on. And it keeps going and going going and going. And you may or may not have a good leader. You know, good leaders, I think, can really help us find our way through. But, you know, we've seen a wide range of leadership across this whole pandemic thing, both on a national state and organizational level. Um, The other thing is that humans want a sense of agency. We Mm -hmm. don't do well if we don't feel like we can control our environment. So since we couldn't control the pandemic, there was three things we could do. We could move, Mm -hmm. which people did in record numbers, just huge mass exodus from the cities, huge real estate market, all this stuff. Um, You can change a relationship. Mm -hmm. which some people did during the pandemic, but now we're seeing divorces and breakups on the rise. Hmm. People kind of hung in (laughs) during the pandemic, but now that's kind of falling apart. And the third thing you can do is change your job. Hmm. So everyone's changing their job. Do you think that uh, part of the pandemic put it in perspective for some people too, like in the sense that, wow, well, there's a burnout factor, but wow, I'm, I'm I'm not really happy in this job. Yeah. So I'm going to change it up. Yeah. I mean, the, some of this stuff has been brewing for a while. We mm-hmm. were already, you know, the, the, the workforce in general has been overused and under supported mm-hmm. as a general theme mm-hmm. um, for a long time. And people put up with a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think two things happened in the pandemic. One was when you stare your mortality in the face, it, it's a values clarification exercise, right. right? So we globally went through what every cancer survivor goes through, which is mm. you get real clear about what matters and what doesn't right. matter. So that shifted a lot. And, and we're seeing a big shift in people wanting more meaning at work, wanting a greater sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. And then they're also looking at their workplace and, and realizing this place stresses me out, or I experience a lot of microaggressions and, and right. you know, harassment by my coworkers. Why do I want to go back there? Or, huh, I'm, you know, this isn't the best match for me. I think I'll look for something better. I just had a friend that left a job because of that reason. Absolutely. Yeah. It's actually the number third reason why people mm-hmm. are leaving are instances of discrimination. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing job changes higher for women and people of color, mm-hmm. which doesn't surprise me because sure. a lot of negative stuff happens at work and people you know, the benefit of the pandemic is people got a break from that. They right. got a bound, they got a really clear boundary with work. Right. And some people don't want to give that up. Right. Let's dive into um, why people resist change. I would love to hear from you um, why that is. Like, what is it in our brains? that resist change? So there's two or three components here. Uh, I would say the first easiest component is that we are actually creatures of habit. In fact, there's a part of our brain, the basal ganglia, that is designed Mm -hmm. for building habits. So it kind of pays attention when we're learning something new. We use a lot of energy in the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. Think about when you were learning to drive a car or use Mm -hmm. software for the first time. You have to concentrate and think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. But when we do a behavior over and over again, the brain is always looking for efficiencies. So once it sees that their behavior is repeated, it it's, wants to turn that into something that doesn't take mu- much energy. Mm-hmm. So the basal ganglia takes things that we do over and over and turns them into an automatic habit that we don't even have to think about. Mm-hmm. You can now drive to work and not actually think about the act of driving a car. Your mm-hmm. body just knows how to do mm-hmm. it. Same with software once you're used to it. So that's what the basal ganglia does. On average, it takes 40 to 50 repetitions to form a habit. 
Oh, I was totally wrong on one of the podcasts that I just did recently. I said 10,000 times. <laughs> well, 10,000. Well, that's movement. Movement. We're talking about movement. Yeah, and you may be getting at mastery. Mastery. That's what it was. 10,000 hours. Yeah. You know, Gladwell's yeah. 10,000 hours for mastery, right? right? And that's, that's where I got really that. where peak athletes and stuff yeah. hang out. But for most of us, you know, you do 10,000 hours to be a car racer driver. Right. Uh, you can get the hang of driving and... 40 to 50 repetitions. But it's easier if those repetitions are close together. Mm -hmm. If you do something once a quarter, or once a month, it's going to take mm -hmm. a long time. So really one of our first resistance to change is that, you know, if you're asking me to change something, I already have a well-grooved habit in place that's mm -hmm. comfortable and easy. Mm -hmm. And trying something new is going to be awkward and uncomfortable and hard. Right. So we default to the easy thing mm -hmm. unless we intentionally give ourselves some reward and we set it up like, okay, I'm going into this thing. It's going to be a little hard at first, but I'm going to give myself reward and I'm going to be mindful of it and, and remembering that it will get easier the more I lean into it. Mm -hmm. So that's the first issue. The second issue that I think makes change hard is that biologically we are wired to see change as potential danger. So if you think about us as the hunter-gatherer you know, species that lived mm -hmm. on the plains, mm -hmm. how we know we're potentially in danger is that our, that our, our senses are constantly scanning the environment, mm -hmm. whether we're aware of it or not. Mm -hmm. And if something changes in our environment, it's the first warning that there could be danger. So thinking about, you know, if you walk past that set of bushes every day and then you notice today that the bushes are a little different, that's the first warning sign that there's a saber-toothed tiger behind that bush. Right. If we were sitting in this room right now and we're all relaxed, but all of a sudden we heard a loud explosion, change. What is right. that? If we smelled fire smoke, whoa, what is that? Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, your, your senses and your amygdala are constantly scanning for change and see change as the first warning sign of danger. Once we get more information, then we can settle down. Oh, there's no danger there. But those of us who have survived this long are descended from people who had highly attuned amygdalas mm -hmm. and who were smart to that change can be a signal of incoming danger. Right. When we look at that for organizational change, what we know is when we roll out change, people tend to have a whole set of negative emotions at the beginning. It's called the change curve. It's mm -hmm. Kubler-Ross's research. But we tend to focus on what could go wrong, how this could go badly, what I could lose. Mm -hmm. And after we get enough information, then we can kind of settle down and start to look toward, well, what could I gain? What could be good? Right. All that stuff. And then this is where leaders can actually make a difference. Some leaders right. announce change and leave a whole lot of ambiguity and give mm -hmm. people a lot of room to spin off into negative stories. Other leaders are really clear and provide real pathway to what we're going to gain and right. how we're going to shift. And then they give people support to learn and develop habits. So how you lead to change, you can, you never make the change curve go away or the resistance go away, but you can shorten the duration and lessen the drama. Right. But it's, it's never zero. No, no, it can't be. And would you say, uh, one of the things that I, that I've witnessed is smaller amounts of change tend to trigger less of a fear response. Yeah. So it's more manageable. Yep. Um, so like, for instance, like I used to give a lot of exercises to people and too much too much and then and then i would i would say okay do this for once a day and some of them were like an hour an hour and a half long and and people who are in a lot of pain would be motivated would be are very motivated yeah. but as soon as the pain drops then they're no longer motivated and it's unrealistic at that point but also i also found that that giving someone two to three exercises to do throughout the day, kind of like what you're saying, if that repetition. Yep. You get them over there, the hump. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, they were able to not, they actually yielded more change yep. that way. Um, and I got that kind of from this, um, are you familiar, are you familiar with Robert Maurer? Mm -mm. He has, uh, um, I, heard, I had all this audio on him lecturing about this concept called Kaizen. And it's basically small changes over time oh, equal yeah. large changes. Yes, yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about that and kind of tie it in with the habit forming of, of 
people and change. So would you say that um, approaching change, it's better to take your time and go small rather than go large? Because most people yeah. want, when they want change, they just want this big giant change right away, right? right? But also on top of that, because I, you know me, I'm always right. experimenting with something. Yeah. And it, and when I talk to people and I go to parties and stuff like that, people, you know, it freaks people out. Like when I do certain things, to some degree, I, I always get, I always get like. Are you freaking people out at parties, I, I Isaac? I do. I always do. I always freak people out for some reason. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe I make people uncomfortable or something because I'm talking. Oh, I'm not experimenting with this, and like I can never do that. Right. You know, that's a lot of what I hear from their mindset. Or at least that's the, what they verbalized to me. I could never do that. Well, you know? a couple of things. There is a formula for change, which is, and you're right on, that the pain of staying the same has to become greater than the pain of change, mm. right? And then mm -hmm. we're motivated. So this is where organizational leaders can do a better job. Like if we don't shift this, eventually the pain here is going to be greater than the pain there. But because right. we're creatures of habit and because we tend to perceive change as potentially negative, we will hang out in an old place for as mm -hmm. long as we possibly can. And so that's why physical pain is a huge motivator, right? People, sure. that pain is literal pain and mm -hmm. they are now motivated to do the hard work of the exercise, right? right? But like a classic example is people who say, I want to lose 10 pounds or mm. I want to get in shape. Well, we all know the formula, right? Mm -hmm. Exercise more, eat less, mm -hmm. you know, make some healthy choices around food. But the problem is the immediate a habit of sitting on my couch and eating Ben and Jerry's ice cream is well grooved. Right. And B, I get a, an immediate reward of comfort and pleasure right. when I do that. If I go to the gym, I'm sweaty, I'm sore, mm -hmm. and while I may be taking a path to the reward I want, it's not immediate. Mm -hmm. It's it's weeks away. Right. So one of the ways you can help yourself is if, let's say you want to work out, is that when you're done with your workout, you give yourself two spoonfuls of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Mm -hmm. The research is pretty clear that, you know, on your way to that 40 to 50 repetitions, if you give the brain a little reward, it will accelerate its embracement of that new habit. Mm. You don't have to reward yourself forever. You can eventually right. drop it, but it helps us get and I like being intentional about it. If you're trying to change a behavior, put it on the calendar 50 times and give yourself a little reward and you can move yourself intentionally in the right direction. But you're, but you're right to do small changes. The other thing we do is overwhelm people. Right. And if you're giving them too much or too big or too many, there's just too many places where they can peel off and go back to the old thing. So right. making it small and easy and lots of little wins mm -hmm. also gives that serotonin dopamine rush to the brain that makes it more cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. My next few questions, I mean, we kind of covered it already. Okay. Like we, we asked, why do people resist change? What does it take to change? Why is repetition so important for change? We touched on those already. But this, what does it take to change? It's a kind of an interesting question. Okay. Um, kind of backing up to what you were just talking about with those small rewards. Um, you do have to be careful with those small rewards too, right? Because that those two bites of ice cream can turn into three to four to five, you know? Right, but it doesn't yeah. have to be food. Like, for example, no, I when I work out, I, I let myself listen to my favorite podcast. Right. So I get a reward while I'm doing it. This podcast. Of course, <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that, that, I'm glad you're touching on that, that, <laughs> that it doesn't have to be food. I mean, that's like kind of the ultimate reward. Right. But establishing those, those habitual changes with some other kind of reward of, of right. something. Doing you know, it with people. There's a uh -huh. social element, um, giving yourself some kind of 
you know, a point system. Our mm-hmm. brain's not very sophisticated. Like it just wants something. Mm-hmm. So even you know, literally, gold stars work. This is why mm-hmm. tracking your steps and getting the little thing at the end of the day. Right. It it doesn't have to be very complex or fancy. Mm-hmm. It just has to be an acknowledgement that you did something. So your brain goes, oh yeah, you know, I you know, I did it. I did it. <laughs> I get the reward. Exactly. Um. So what's the best way to set up change to be successful? So it occurs on a couple levels, you know, thinking about organizational change when someone is driving other people's change, like Mm -hmm. a senior leader decides that they want to migrate to a new software or rebrand the product or something. You know, one is you have to remember that by the time you announce the change, you've already gone through this whole emotional process yourself and you've achieved this new, like hopeful, excited outlook. But when you announce it, people are going to start at the beginning of the change curve and Mm -hmm. go to that negative place of what could we lose and how could this be awful? So one is you should plan for that and not be bummed by it um, when it happens. There is going to be some drama. But you can really help people by communicating clearly, communicating over and over again, being super transparent, uh, you know, breaking it into manageable steps, having milestones. There's a lot of ways you can take change and make it manageable and positive. And so leaders can really make a difference with how change rolls out by using a few strategies. But remember, right. you can lessen the time, you know, you can shorten the time, lessen the drama, you don't make it go away altogether. Managers who are oftentimes kind of in that middle window between they didn't get to design it, but they have to get people through it, they play a really important role too in terms of how they manage those day-to-day relationships, their emotional intelligence and being able to deal with people's grumbling, mm. knowing how to motivate people or tap into their own sense of purpose filling in the gaps that aren't built into the plan. There's a lot that can happen there. And then those of us on the receiving end of change, we can approach it from an attitude of, oh, this is being done by me. And we can certainly get really victim-y about mm-hmm. it and really you know, pile on a bunch of stuff that makes us even more resistant. Or we can realize, oh, I play a role in this too. And regardless of how good the managers or leaders are above me, how can I find something I can gain from this change? What's a skill I could get? Is this something I could put on my resume? Do I get to do it with a team of people I really like? How do I make this work for myself? If there's not rewards built into it, maybe you partner with a couple friends and you figure out your change journey and you build in your own moments of reward or your own moments of celebration. And then, you know, it's it's also okay to ask for help. Like if you're not clear on something, Mm -hmm. asking for that support. You know, part of why I work with you is I care about having a body that's healthy, but I know I have a block on motivating myself. And so using your expertise and leaning on you to be kind of my accountability partner and to push me is a way that I've set myself up for success because I know that I struggle in this area, Mm -hmm. right? So part of it is also, you know, supporting yourself in the changes you want to make mm-hmm. and 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 realizing that you have a role to be an active participant in it and that's right. an attitude you know the attitude we can choose right and we can bring to any situation around change i really like what you're saying and there's there's something that would i try to think of when i'm about to embark on change for myself i'm going to experiment with the exercise or i'm going to experiment with a, with the eating a certain way is I'll say, I'm going to do it for this period of time. Yeah. And I think, I think not this conversation, but another conversation we had at one point, you talked about change fatigue. Yes. And would you say that's important to put those brackets on there? I'm going to do this for 90 days. I'm going to do this for 60 days. I'm going to do this for two weeks. Just so I can, I can see, because at any point in time, if it's too painful, right? right. If it's too painful for you, you can stop and adjust it. Does that tie into what you're saying? So change fatigue is when change is coming at us so fast and furious that we never really get to set onto a new normal Mm. and get those habits established and let change become kind of automatic before we're dealing with another one. Mm -hmm. So change fatigue happens a lot in organizations because you know, as soon as an organization gets to a certain size, marketing is pushing out change. HR is pushing out change. Mm -hmm. Facilities is pushing out change. And a team can be hit with multiple changes at the same time. Change fatigue can happen in our personal lives too. I mean, I was in the middle of the, when the acquisition happened, which meant overnight, I was reporting to a new person 500 miles away. Everything about my job changed. This is at LinkedIn. Yeah. When the acquisition happened, 
I was already in the middle of a kitchen remodel and moving my mom to assisted living. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have a change bandwidth. Right. And when we, change is a little bit stressful. It requires our attention. And so when we have a lot of change happening at one time, this is part of why everyone struggled during the pandemic, it's a lot. And so part of change fatigue is when, if we don't have choices and we're put into that overload, we can get exhausted or overwhelmed mm -hmm. by change. But it also means that we can be more thoughtful around changes. So Chris and I, my husband and I actually a couple times a year kind of map our changes and we figure out where are we going to have some intense times, mm. you know, and maybe that's a time that we don't travel to see family. Maybe right. that's a time we don't take on a project. So we try to be mindful of keeping track of like what's on our plate change wise and then setting ourselves up for success. But if you do, you know, everyone was pushed into change fatigue with the pandemic because we had no choices. We all had to change. And it was a lot of change mm -hmm. that keeps going on. Then it's about self-care. Right. It's about getting more sleep. It's about mindfulness. It's about laughter. It's about, you know, doing what you can to make it easier on yourself mm -hmm. and, and, you know, <laughs> just finding your way through it. One more thing that I want to ask you about since uh, this month's, subject or overall umbrella of the podcast is going to be change mm -hmm. and uh, this month is is going to be january mm -hmm. we're obviously recording this not in january uh, close to it though close to it very close. i can see it right around it the corner right around the corner so new year's resolutions oh yeah what do you think about new year's re resolutions from everything that you've said what are the pros and cons and it, also what are the pros and cons of it from a perspective of um, what can people do to really achieve more success? I mean, obviously yeah. taking everything that you've said is going to help, but specifically on that, this is the time of year where everyone is doing year's resolution. My phone starts ringing off the hook. Everybody wants to change. Yep. And um, I think that three top three pointers for yep. people on New Year's resolutions. So we want you guys to start off with a gangbuster year of change. Yep. What would you say to that? Great, great question. Resolutions are wonderful if they're truly your resolution. So tip mm. number one is are you doing it because you feel like you should or because you really want to? Mm. You know, if you don't really want to lose 20 pounds, if you are fine with your life the way it is, then setting that resolution for yourself, you're not going to have the motivation to, to do it. You know, you're, you're setting up for failure. You're setting yourself up for failure. And yeah. a lot of people around health resolutions, you know, women in particular, you know, we're sold body images that are not realistic. Right. And if you're holding yourself to a standard, I think this happens with men in terms of, you know, getting muscular or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then non-binary folks, you know, where they fall in terms of what their goals are. Sure. I think you got to make sure it's your goal and not a magazine's goal or a social right. media goal. Because if it's truly your goal, you're going to have your own reasons for it. When you are... Can, can I just yes? say one thing on that? Yeah. How do you tap into that? So one, like, for instance, how do you tap into the goal of this is what my mind wants instead of my heart, so to speak. Yep. If, we, if maybe we should separate them like that. And one of the things that I do personally to try to weed out those kind of thought processes yeah. um, is how do I feel, mm -hmm. right? How do I feel about that change? And also when I identify that, how do I feel about that? It's a, it's a perfect baseline or, or reminder for me when I'm in that, process of change i have to go to the feeling mm -hmm. rather than going to the idea of it yeah yeah i think what you're asking people to do is get really clear about what the outcome is so it's not just is it a number on a scale mm -hmm. it's like what does that represent to you right. it, you know will you be feeling less pain will you be feeling more attractive will you be feeling more flexible right and have people really picture and bring up the feeling tone of mm -hmm living that outcome, not the idea of that outcome. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. So one is make sure you really want it and get clear yeah. about that vision for yourself. Mm -hmm. The second one is what we've already talked about. You know, I, I think people can set like 10 resolutions, all of which are really big and vague. Right. None of them are going to get done. Right. There's a lot of research that shows that 
we can have a lot of priorities, but the more priorities we have, the less we're going to accomplish any of them. Mm-hmm. So one to three is the magic number. Mm-hmm. If we have one to three really crisp priorities, the chance of achieving them with excellence is quite high. Mm-hmm. The minute you add four or more, it goes down exponentially. So I wouldn't try to solve all the world's problems with one new year. Like pick one or two things Mm -hmm. and get really clear about what they are and then take those one or two things and break it up into those small winnable steps. Make it the step so small you can't fail. And then reward yourself along the way. Mm -hmm. And this is why some of the apps like Noom and stuff can be really helpful is that, you know, it's Mm -hmm. giving you those little moments. Um, And then also give yourself some grace changing a habit means that occasionally you're going to do the old habit right and then you don't want to beat yourself up about it it's about can i put more days in the new habit and decrease the the other days in the old habit Mm -hmm. that's the winning formula and and so people who are like oh i fell off the wagon now it's all over right that's a really harsh way of treating yourself it's really intense it's a really intense way to look at things because I typically say, I don't know if it's correct or not, but you know, we're, we're trial by error creatures. Absolutely. Right. And so failure is actually a good thing, it not is. a bad thing. Yeah. Right. So embracing that failure, like, Oh, I failed. Okay. That's information that's data in a lot of ways. If you yep. can detach yourself emotionally from it, I failed. What did I do to lead up to that? Right. You know, I, I didn't get enough sleep last night mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever I, I, I talked with my wife about an intense situation before I ate, had anything to eat. You know, that was number one. Like, right. uh, uh, my, <laughs> my wife and I got some really good relationship advice early on from some, some really good friends of ours. She's like, they're like, do the dishes together. Never have intense conversations before you eat. <laughs> like when you're hangry? <laughs> yeah. Like, it just escalates, right? It yeah. just goes through the roof. Yeah. That um, works for teenagers too, by the yeah. way. Yes, it does. <laughs> All children. All children, exactly. All humans. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's wonderful, Britt. I, I, really, um, I really appreciate your time coming with me on the podcast today. Absolutely. And you are my first guest. Yay. And, um, and I crushed it, and everyone will pale in comparison you, from here out. You did. You absolutely <laughs> crushed it. This was a lot of fun, and it's, it's so much fun talking with you about this. I think we could probably talk for quite some time. We could. And uh, at some point, maybe have you back on. Yeah, let's do another one. And uh, again, thank you for being on the show with me. Where can people find you? They can find me. The best way is my name, BritAndriata.com. So just look in the show notes. I'm sure there'll be a link there. And uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Everything I'm up to is on my website. And I hope to connect with some of your listeners. It would be lovely to to learn more about them. Yeah. So I'll include all that in the show notes. Great. And if there's any other links that you want me to put in the show notes, I will absolutely. So there will be there. So everyone, anyone that's listening... Links will be in the show notes. Do you yes, and we can that? we can give you links to some free chapters from my book on change, oh, Wired to Resist. So yeah. we'll make sure that that's linked as well, and they can check it out and see if that if if you know reading the brain science of change might give them some new insights too. Wonderful. Thank you, Britt. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you liked it, please subscribe and leave a positive review so others may find it and get help too. Check out the show notes for links on how to win a mini integrator massage gun, posture strength and mobility classes that focus on corrective exercises, or self-myofascial release protocols for neck pain, back pain, knee pain, plantar fasciitis, and much more with my massage gun, The Integrator. Until next time, keep exploring your body and stay curious. Stay curious.